You're listening to How to Win Friends and Save the Republic, a podcast from the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers. I'm your host, Andy Moore. My guest today is Amber McReynolds. Amber was born and raised in Illinois and attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and later received a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Amber served as the chief election officer for the city of Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, from 2011 to 2018. And while she was there, she led the city's implementation of an entirely vote-by-mail system, including a pretty amazing state-of-the-art electronic ballot tracking and notification system, and uh, also implemented an electronic signature gathering and verification system that can be used for petitions. Amber currently serves as the CEO for the National Vote at Home Institute, and earlier this year, she was named to the United States Postal Service Board of Governors. Welcome to my friend and colleague, Amber McReynolds. Well, it's great to be here, Andy. Thank you for having me. Everything that we do in the democracy reform space is salient and important, and it feels urgent. But I do feel like the topics we're going to talk about today with voting systems are maybe more pressing or at least more top of mind than some other of the more, you know, deep dive, wonky, in the weeds political stuff uh, that is also important. But this is just what's dominating the headlines. So, I think maybe let's start back a little bit at the beginning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about you and how you come to this work. Uh, And so I guess my first question really is, what drew you to a career that's based around voting and elections? Sure. Well, I I grew up in a small town in Illinois, as you mentioned. Um, Both of my parents were in public service in one way or another. my, my mom stayed home with us when we were little, but she was a teacher prior and then went back to teaching when uh, we got older. And then my dad was actually a defense lawyer and had his own practice and served as public defender for a long time. And then he became a judge. Uh, now, I think more than 30 years ago now, he's been on the bench and, and is still serving today. Uh, so I you know, come from a background definitely rooted in public service and I was always interested in government and politics. Um, but I think even more more than all of that, and just kind of from a higher visionary perspective, um, I truly believe that that we all need to do our part to leave the world a better place than we found it. Uh, I'm a creative uh, type person. I'm solution orientated, and I've just I've always sort of gravitated to challenges uh, to solve because I see them really as opportunities. And so, you know, that's kind of what's driven me my entire life and certainly in the election space. Um, I started, you know, as you mentioned, I was over overseas in London doing my master's and I worked in parliament as a research aide and really got ingrained in kind of the politics and moving policies forward in the United Kingdom uh, and had wonderful uh, experiences through that. And then when I moved back to the United States, Uh, I entered a a field um, that was, again, focused on solutions around improving the citizens' experience through various government systems. Then I went to the New Voters Project, which was a nonpartisan, nonprofit project uh, focused on student engagement during the 2004 presidential election. And that was really in that process that highlighted for me how many barriers, how confusing some of the laws and the procedures are, uh, how outdated some of the laws and procedures are, and frankly, how um, uh, backwards a lot of our systems are around the voting process. And then in that job, I was actually traveling to Denver quite a bit for conferences and trainings. And the first time I came to Denver, I I loved the city and um, I was, you know, really interested in elections and voting. And I I started looking around for for jobs. And actually, the first job I applied for was an operational manager job at the the Denver Elections Office. So back in 2005, uh, after my project finished during the presidential cycle, I applied for this uh, job at Denver Elections and Um, and became their absentee ballot and military ballot coordinator uh, way back in 2005 now. And 
when I entered that office, um, I found an office that was not focused on serving voters, not putting voters first. They had kind of done things the same old way for 30 years. There was a lot of ingrained perspectives about uh, sort of what they were doing and there wasn't really energy to innovate and improve and continuously improve. Um, so I was on an island, honestly, when I first was there for the first few years. And then Denver actually had a technology failure uh, that was in the field. I was running the absentee ballot process, but they had a significant technology failure in 2006. And so I went through a bad election, long lines. Uh, I, you know, my team were, we were managing a different part of the election that actually worked fine, but we all had to kind of jump in and try to help on the customer service side of things. And so I really, honestly, right before my eyes, I saw a failure of leadership, a failure of uh, testing and, and operational issues ahead of the election. And a lot of people got fired out of that and what have you. Um, but I stayed and became part of the solution going forward and, and was promoted to deputy director, was a big part of uh, reforming the organization. And then once we were able to do all that, then we were able to kind of move forward with policy reforms, innovations, technology. So it would, you know, my, my um, career and my track to the point where I'm at now um, was about seeing some of these very big problems happen right before my eyes in the office I was in. And I knew I learned very quickly that you never want to have that happen again. And I, you know, um, learned a lot of very valuable lessons at a very young age in this business um, about how best to run elections. And so my whole career now has been focused on that. I truly I think I kind of might have been one of the first ones saying that we need to put voters first in speeches years ago uh, that I was giving. And, and that has been my mantra, like we need to design systems that put the customer, the voters first, center the process around the voter. Um, and, and you know, for the most part, the laws on the books in most states do not do that. Uh, and so we have, a, we have a lot of work to do. And I, I look at all the challenges and all I see are opportunities. Um, that's how I kind of, you know, try to, try to formulate uh, the work I do is is looking for those opportunities to move forward, and um, and it's it's great to be in a community of people that you know really deeply care about democracy, like uh, so many of our organizations that work together. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I had that same phrase of uh, or juxtaposition of challenges and opportunities as you were kind of telling your story there. I think that's right, and and I think it's really important that we we hear what you said about uh, election administration is not just the nuts and bolts of how we get ballots tallied and counted and, and all of that. But there is a, heaven forbid, there's a customer service element to it that can work, I think, work together in like a, you know, to use a buzzword, a synergistic way, right, with with the bureaucracy of election administration to make a, a more effective and more efficient and easier, more accessible election for all voters. And at the same time, right, it can reduce the burden on election officials so they can run like a more efficient election from from their side of things as well. That's, that's exactly right. And this is a very technical system and process. And the United States is pretty unique in that we have a lot of partisan politics infused in the conduct of elections. Um, I think that has actually created a lot of the issues that we see today with the partisanship and sort of the politicization of, of election administration broadly. Um, and it, you know, it does need to be about the voters. Uh, so many of our laws on the books and so much of this has been driven by who wins as opposed to who votes. And so we've got to flip that and focus on who votes, not who wins. Um, in how we design policies, how we create systems, how we implement technology, all with an effort to put the voter at the center and first and, and focus on that customer side. And I, the other thing I always say to folks is the more successful election officials are in the delivery of these services to the public, the more successful voters are going to be in the process. So anything we can do to improve procedures, policies, systems, uh, infrastructure, investment, 
all of that across the board for election officials, the voters are going to be the direct beneficiaries of that uh, of that investment, that change, that improvement. Um, and it doesn't matter which party, you know, the vote and sort of how that works is a separate thing. And what we're seeing so much of now is that there's this infusion of the partisan conversation into election administration. And that's where we really, I think, I believe, have lost our way in terms of system improvement and uh, that focus on who votes as opposed to who wins. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about a lot more than the parties and the outcome. It's about the process of voting. I mean, heck, we've had, we've been voting for longer than these two parties have been around, right? Like this isn't a new thing. Do you, you know, you, I, I hear in what you're saying, like a, a, a undercurrent of conversation about uh, not just voting, but like equality or equity and justice uh, and knowing the history of your parents. Do you think some of that like comes from, I mean, your dad being on the, being on the bench for 30 years and, and being a defense attorney before that as, as one example, um, I, I would almost, I, I would assume or guess that some of that, um, those lessons you learn from your parents still today kind of influence how you approach your work. They, they absolutely do. My parents have had a tremendous impact and even my great grandmother and my great aunt and, um, and, and both of my grandmothers all had um, big impacts. My, both my grandmothers and my great aunt and great grandmother were all election judges. Um, I think all of them except one did not drive and they literally would walk to their voting location that they served at. They were extremely committed public servants. And uh, so that definitely is, is stories that I heard at a young age and we would take my grandmother, you know, lunch at her polling place and that kind of thing. So, um, so this is deeply rooted in, in me. Um, I truly believe that we not only have to work on the system and the voting process and how to improve it. But we, we also have to look at it in a holistic way that includes extending to, to systems like the Postal Service and other agencies and other entities that are involved in this process. But I think more importantly, the other piece that we've got to do is, is create a civic education path that starts in the first grade. And the reason I go back that far, I mean, we often hear so many people say, well, it's all about civics in high school. That is far too late to start having the conversation around engagement, education, how to how to be an informed voter, the voting process. It's way too late to get there. And so with a system like like Vote at Home, and I, I've been doing this for years since my children could basically read, uh, which started really in kindergarten. Every election that my ballot comes, they come in and they're eight and 10 now and they say, mom, when are we gonna work on your ballot? And we sit at the kitchen table. Denver's ballot is always super long, three pages last year uh, with lots of issues, but it's a civics lesson for them every single cycle. And they, they say, mom, what does governor do? What does mayor do? What does the state rep? What does this issue mean? And we research things and we talk about it and I give them examples of, of how the mayor impacts their lives. And, you know, even after the mayor's race um, last year, we were driving and I had just turned and, and I take them to drop my ballot off, by the way, they go and put it in a box and they have that experience. Um, but after I submitted my ballot, we went to the park and they actually were both like, you know, they need to redesign the playground at the park. And I said, oh, really? What are your ideas? And they started telling me. And uh, they said, mom, who's in charge of that? And I said, actually, it's the city. And there's a parks department that works for the mayor. And if you have ideas, you should write a letter to the mayor and tell him what your ideas are and write a letter to the parks department. Well, they had just had the voting experience and they knew that that was happening. And so they made all these powerful connections. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm a huge, huge advocate. And this is probably one of the next things I really want to work on um, is, is this civics education and building a 12 year civics education program from, from first grade all the way through, uh, through senior and high school, maybe those last two years, they're poll workers right before they then vote. I mean, you know, we could do something that I think would be extremely powerful in educating the future electorate, getting them engaged early on and helping them understand how their government works for them. Because I think that's what we've really lost in a lot of this uh, partisan infighting that's been happening. 
Yeah, I think you're right. It is. I've worked with some programs that were based around civic engagement among youth, specifically middle school and high school, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, and certainly, I agree. That's not soon enough. But that's who I worked with. Mm-hmm. And to see those students, uh, like brains, turn on when they realized that they could have an impact on everything from playgrounds to state policy, and they were looking for ways to do it. They were fearless. They were excited, and they recognized, I think, quicker than you know some of the the state legislators here in, in my state that that they would be written off because they couldn't vote. And they said, "I can't vote this year, but I can next year." And they like knew that the next year was an election year. And the fact that I saw that recognition in the eyes of a 17 year old before I saw it in the eyes of the elected official, I thought the kids are all right. Like maybe our future is a little bit yeah. brighter. That's right. Well, and I think like, you know, this engaging them and being a poll worker, like most, a lot of states, you can do it at 16. Colorado certainly had that. Um, I mean, they were just incredible poll workers. I mean, the students, they were just so excited. And it's a way for them to be involved, you know, before they vote. They can pre-register to vote in a lot of states too. So I just really think building up this education and then ending it with direct engagement and then the voting process itself would really, I think, shift uh, how we're educating students, how we're um, teaching them about the history of voting rights and, and how these things have transpired over time. I can't tell you the number of people you know, when we wrote we wrote a book uh, called When Women Vote, and we we highlighted a lot of the history around the the Nineteenth Amendment. So many women, um, young and you know, uh, kind of in our generation, said, "I didn't know X, Y, and Z," or "I didn't realize this happened with this," or "I didn't realize that Colorado passed it on a ballot initiative, not in the legislature." That only men could vote on the ballot initiative, by the way. Um, And a lot of people didn't realize it started in the West more than 25 years before the 19th Amendment passed. So there were so many things about it. And as people kept saying that, I was like, we are not doing enough to educate our our everyone on kind of the history of this. And what if we if we don't do that, it's going to repeat itself. Right. So we really need to be thoughtful, I think, about all those aspects, too. And um and, and and looking at those trends, like the Western conversation is sort of an interesting one, like women's suffrage passed far earlier in the West than it did in the East. And that actually tracks with vote by mail, expansion of early voting, expansion of voter registration options. All those things have happened in Western states first. <laughs> so there's some, you know, there's some trends and there's some similarities with uh, these pieces over time, which I think are important to think about. That's that's right. I'm glad you brought that up. So, uh, yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, you co-authored a book last year uh, with Stephanie Donner called "When Women Vote," and one of the you've I always this sounds juvenile, but I like a book that has some illustrations or pictures, and your book does um, yeah. because I think well, we don't all just learn from reading, right? Like it's nice to see something visual, and that map uh, it happens to be on page 33 of the status of women's suffrage as a state by or as of 1919 struck me because because of that i guess i we kind of assumed that the united states started on the east coast and then you know we had westward expansion as we settled the continent and i i think i realized i had a internal assumption that that's how policies like this happened back then right mm-hmm. and you know i live in uh, in oklahoma which is in the middle of the country and we are uh, well accustomed to policies happening on the coasts and then arriving here 10 or 20 years later. Uh, but to see that suffrage was the reverse, right? That it started mm-hmm. in the West and went back to the East um, and that many States still didn't have it by 1919 uh, was pretty shocking. Now they were, I think largely in the, in the South or what was known as the South in the beginning. Um, but yeah, it's a, it was a great book. I, I appreciated learning about it. And I really liked that you, I mean, the book is just filled with stories Mm-hmm. of women encountering civics, right? Voting, gerrymandering, all kinds of issues uh, and how they uh, how they were confronted by those things and, and develop solutions or workarounds or, you know, reached out to other people to, to build solutions. That's right. And we, you know, what was great about it, we interviewed women of all different party affiliations of different age demographics. 
And what really struck me is, you know, when you hear, and some of them face barriers, some of them we were, we've pretty much confirmed that their ballots did not count because they voted a provisional, even though they were duly registered and they encountered issues. Um, and, and and then you go to the, the woman that we interviewed in Texas, who was a Republican in El Paso, and her issue was really about primaries. She felt that her vote didn't matter in a very blue district because she was a Republican. And so as she's articulating this, I'm like, this is no different than what you hear from voters that face suppression and other issues. And so, you know, there's a universality to all of this. And I truly believe voters want to vote and they want to ensure that the, the system has integrity and that it's accessible and it's accountable and transparent and all those things. And there's solutions for all of this. And yet it often gets stuck in the partisan fight and bickering of the day, which is not productive for the American people at all. Yeah, that's right. Well, so, you know, I think voting reforms, especially mail-in voting, are obviously a huge issue for you. You are the leader of the National Vote at Home Institute. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that issue in particular. What, uh, what's in general terms, what states do it really well? Is there a gold standard that other states should be aspiring to? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, so, you know, Oregon really started this back in the nineties and then Washington, uh, kind of went that direction and then Colorado and, and what, you know, Colorado, what we did with our reform, and this is the one, obviously I worked on directly and was a big, a big, uh, part of passing it. We tried to look to Oregon and Washington and learn kind of what they had done and then expand on it. And so, one of the big things that we did in Colorado is we wanted to modernize voter registration. So we wanted to create automatic registration and also eliminate the uh, burdensome deadlines that were frankly just confusing the public and creating really high provisional numbers. Um, and so to do that though, if you're gonna create same day registration where you can register on the day of the election or even the days before, and you want a mail ballot, you have to set up a structure to do in-person voting because if you're not registered a week out, you're, we're not going to be able to mail you a ballot. So that's kind of where the vote center concept came from. And that really modernizes the election day and early voting experience so that voters can go to any of them. Um, so, you know, and that's that model California followed. Oregon and Washington have adopted some of those things we did in Colorado, you know, so that I would call it a Western model because uh, Nevada has kind of done that now in Hawaii. Um, so that's really in my mind, that's the best of the best. There's also some states in various regions of the country that do certain things well or or have have taken things from that kind of Western model. Arizona has always had a pretty good system with their permanent absentee early voting list. Uh, they've started, they've, they've adjusted a few things this year because of the partisan politics. Montana was in that category as well. So really, I think what you're hearing me say is the Western states have had some really good programming around this. Eastern states, not as much, frankly. And, and really until the pandemic hit, states like New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts they had never offered no excuse absentee. So there's been a massive expansion now in the Eastern side of the country because they recognize their, their resiliency issues with the pandemic, but I think also just realize the, the benefit to voters. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing now more and more attention paid on this. And so there are best practices coming out, things like ballot tracking are expanding greatly. Um, the use of the tools around intelligent mail, mail tracking, uh, better envelope designs, like that's been a big focus, instructional design. Um, all of those things have gotten far better across the country due to a lot of the work uh, that's happening in the nonprofit space, but also due to the, the leadership, frankly, of local election offices that are recognizing the need for a lot of this to happen. Um, and now if the legislatures would just get out of the way and let it happen, we could, you know, uh, drive uh, really far down the road um, to accomplish a lot of this. Yeah. Imagine that. I had, I had oh, never. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I had never even considered how a ballot is designed as being an important factor until I think this last year. And sure. I read some article about it and started Googling and holy moly, 
uh, there are some beautiful ballots out there. My state is not one of them. Uh, we have yeah. a very a very functional first ballot. Uh, but I, I agree. So I, you know, I'm in Oklahoma, and I think a lot of people in my state did not realize that we have had no excuse absentee voting for years. And mm -hmm. so they were when the pandemic hit, it was kind of a relief, I think, to a lot of voters to realize this was already in place. We didn't have to change the law in order to vote absentee. They made some tweaks to make it a little bit easier in some ways. It's still a little cumbersome with, you know, notary requirements and some of those steps. But, uh, but I think overall, it resulted in a, a pretty safe and, and certainly a secure election. You know, we have the standard paper ballots that are uh, optically scanned and all of that. So there's, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done. There's so much to the, like, I cannot over state the importance of instructions that voters receive. I mean, if you think about it, the other benefit of vote by mail, which never gets, this doesn't get talked about a lot. Number one, you can go farther down the ballot because you have more time to research issues. So it creates a more informed electorate. But number two, in-person voting locations rely, frankly, mostly on the election judge articulating the instructions for the process to the voter. Now, if you have a thousand election judges in a jurisdiction, you're going to basically have a thousand different articulations of the instructions to thousands of voters on election day. The benefit, you know, of vote by mail, every voter gets the exact same packet, the same instructions on the envelope, the same inside, the same on the top of the ballot. So there's a significant benefit to that because now you're basically saying everyone's getting the exact same wording, the exact same instruction. There's you're you're almost infusing even more equity across the entire system into the process. And so those instructions are a key component to uh, voter success in the process, filling out their ballot correctly, returning it on time, all those things. And our, um, our partners at the Center for Civic Design, Whitney Quisenberry leads that, has had, they've been on the leading edge of helping jurisdictions rethink ballot envelope design and instructions. Um, and I also, by extension, think that there's some work that the United States Postal Service can be a good partner to election officials in, in terms of the envelope design, making it run through the postal service more, more quickly, but also ensuring that delivery is successful. And so there's, there's techniques we can do to make those things happen. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned that, you know, as we said earlier, you were recently appointed to the board of governors for the, the postal service and who among us even knew they had a board of governors uh, yeah. until we saw that news, uh, that news brief. That's very exciting. What was that, like you so you're the first no you're the only female on the board and according to what i read that you are the first person to serve on that board that has experience with voting in elections so what does it mean for you to be there yeah there, there's a couple for first um i i am the first person that has had election experience which is a big deal um and then the second thing is i'm the first independent that served on the board of governors so uh, the way that the law works is there cannot be more than five Democrats or five Republicans. Um, and, and the, and the postal service is an independent entity of the executive branch. It's not part of the executive branch. It's independent from, uh, the legislative, the executive and, and the, you know, so it's an independent entity. Um, and it's overseen by this board of governors that was passed in the postal reform act, uh, 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 the Postal Re Restoration Act um, many years ago, and it established this independent authority. Um, so similar to a Fortune 100, it's a board of directors essentially that oversees this massive infrastructure. Um, so, and yes, I am now, I'm the only female, I'm the only independent, I'm the only person with election background. Um, the other fascinating thing, which a lot of people don't know, is that the Postal Service has 31,000 or more retail locations around the country. There is a postal office or facility in almost every community in the country. Uh, they have 650,000 employees. They have over 200,000 vehicles that deliver your mail to you. That doesn't even count all of the massive trucks and, and also the use of airlines. Uh, when you're on a Southwest flight, sometimes there might be mail flying with you, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, so the infrastructure for this, and they also deliver, this is another number, but they deliver to 160 million households every day, 
six or seven days a week. Um, so you think about that infrastructure, the power of that, the access that the public has to this, and then you think about and couple that with all the needs in the election industry, and you can already start to feel and see a lot of the synergies. And election officials don't just send ballots by mail. They actually send far more pieces of mail that are not a ballot. So voter registration letters, polling place notices, voter information guides, all the stuff that you get uh, comes to you through the Postal Service. So it's a key partnership in terms of delivering equitable public service and universal service around the country. And the other interesting thing really about all of it is the challenges the Postal Service face are almost exactly parallel to the challenges that election administrators face. And also the mission is almost perfectly aligned. In the law, the Postal Service has to deliver and provide universal service. That's exactly the same for election officials, that they have to provide universal access to all voters uh, to the process and ensure that there's equity. Um, and then the challenges are very similar. Lack of investment, lack of funding, uh, challenges scaling up during peak season, getting enough temporary employees uh, to come in, which is the same challenge election officials face. Um, and a massive infrastructure and a lot of outdated policies, outdated technology. I mean, literally uh, all of a lot of the same challenges are exactly the same in both. So so I am um, I'm deeply honored to be a part of, of this in this new role. And, you know, I really think the opportunities are vast for the Postal Service um, and by extension, the customers that use the Postal Service daily. Um, there are massive opportunities uh, uh, with all the challenges that the Postal Service has. And we want to, we as a board, I think are all committed to making sure that the Postal Service um, uh, continues to act under the law as it's allocated in the Constitution to provide that universal uh, service across the country. Well, it sounds like uh, you are the right person for the job, and I'm glad that, that you got appointed to serve on that. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> We, uh, I kind of want to end, I would, I would be amiss if we didn't discuss some of the attacks that we are seeing on voting rights and, and specifically absentee voting. We've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what, I, what do you think is really behind them? Is it, is it just as simple as, you know, somebody lost the election and the people that voted for that person are upset about it? Or do you feel like there's something else that is kind of uh, feeding into this, this outrage? Well, I think I think it's definitely a multi-dimensional problem. So, I mean, f first and foremost, the disinformation. I mean, this is this is a full-on disinformation campaign that's been, frankly, being run even prior to the election. Um, it is it is very much about one person that did not get more votes than the other person that refuses to accept that he didn't get as many votes. Um, that that's the baseline of everything, and so. He was using vote by mail. He was using Dominion uh, voting systems. Anything that they could basically throw at the wall and see what would stick was what they were trying. Uh, the other thing a lot of people don't know, the Stop the Steal website was purchased before 2016. So the whole movement around this was started back then because of the same concern. He thought when he, if he were to not win that election, he would just say it was all fraudulent. This has been a strategy that they have been working on for a long period of time. Um, there's also a significant number of conspiracy theorists that basically do not have any understanding of the election process, the laws on the books, what actually happens, what are meaningful audits, and all the existing laws and procedures. I mean, this all is because the general public and most people do not understand anything about this process. And that by extension goes to politicians. Most politicians actually do not know how an election is run and they cannot articulate that to you. And they've probably never even toured a local election official's office to see the process. Um, so when you, you have this tsunami of disinformation and then you have the vast majority of the public that doesn't understand the real process, it's easy to mislead people. Um, it's also easy for disinformation to spread when the laws vary so greatly by state and we don't have a lot of federal baselines for some of these things to happen. Um, so it, it very much is 
someone lost refuses to accept that and then now is taking advantage of the public's lack of understanding of some of these things. Um, I truly believe, you know, vote by mail was certainly attacked. We've been doing our best to respond to that disinformation. Dominion has been completely maligned and just frankly lied about, defamed uh, by all sorts of sources. It's not just a few, it's a long list. And it was certainly coordinated. Um, I believe uh, attacking them simply um, uh, because again, throwing things at the wall, nothing nefarious, anything like that. It's all been disproven. Uh, I use Dominion system in Denver. I know exactly how it works. In fact, it's been, it was designed originally to focus on paper ballots and audit and how to get the best data out of the system to audit it. I mean, it was all designed that way. Um, so, you know, to me, they're, they're, the attacks on them are probably the greatest issue right at this moment because election officials are feeling that on their end. Um, and there's a concerted effort to destroy their business to prevent them from fighting their lawsuits. Um, and that's happening. And, and, you know, they are part of critical infrastructure. And so if the, if the EAC and the federal government did not protect our nation's critical infrastructure sufficiently from this, we need to also address that. We need to address the attacks on election officials and also the attacks on our nation's infrastructure, because this is critical infrastructure, just like the energy grid, just like the water, the, the water grid, just like all of our nation's infrastructure. And so it is under attack and we have to do more to protect it going forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for listeners who, you know, uh, care about this kind of stuff, what, what can we do? How can, how can we as organizations or even as individuals help support uh, an election system that is robust, that is safe, that is secure, that is effective? Uh, what can we do? Well, I think there's a couple of things, I, and I'll just quickly uh, go through a, a high-level list. Um, I think first, we definitely have to have a governance discussion around elections. So what is the federal governance role? What is the state role? And what is the local role? Uh, there is a lack of clarity, which also has been problematic in a pandemic. Um, we have identified many gaps where either states or locals needed more resources and couldn't access them, or the system wasn't resilient in an emergency situation. And so we've got to address all of that. And then I think that given the failures of the federal governance structure to protect technology providers and protect election officials, we've got to have that conversation and create a truly independent authority that can handle these things and, and, and work in a way that's not infused with partisan politics as it is today. The second big thing, got, got to prevent and penalize people that are attacking election officials and trying to interfere with election officials in their official duties. Uh, that means phone calls from a candidate to a secretary of state telling them to find votes. That means harassing local election offices. All of that should be a federal felony and it should be I believe, you know, need, I believe it needs to be at the federal level so that the FBI and the Department of Justice can thoroughly investigate and deal with those situations going forward. Having it just in the state laws is not sufficient because, frankly, none of it's being acted on, followed up on, or what have you, because state law enforcement or local law enforcement are too busy or don't see it as a big enough issue. Uh, so I think that has to happen. Um, we have to have a systems discussion and make sure that election officials have the money they need to run their elections. Uh, we have new threats before us. We have new technology issues. Uh, we, they need investment. We need strategic and long-term investment, not just one allocation of money under the Help America Vote Act 20, 20 years ago after Florida. We need sustainable support for these offices at the local level long-term. That's a big deal. Um, and then we need federal baselines for uh, legislation and, 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 and uh, policies and procedures and deadlines. Uh, it is confusing across the country. It varies greatly if you move from one state to the other. And I just think that if we can get some baselines in place, it will, it will improve the lives of voters and also by extension election officials long term. Um, and then I think we have to have also the strategic discussion of you know, what other reforms, you know, the voter transaction, putting voters first, making sure they have access is one part of it. 
and then what the primaries look like, how those ballots look, how you're making your choices to ensure that your vote isn't lost after your candidate drops out in a primary or what have you. We need to have those discussions, ranked choice voting, open primaries, all those things are part of that to make sure people are enfranchised long term. Um, so that'd be my, you know, it's kind of governance, investment, policy issues, system issues. Um, and then, you know, really all of that is is with a goal of putting voters first and centering this process around how to improve the lives of voters as opposed to politicians. So that's that's great. Amber, thank you so much for being here with us today. If listeners want to connect with you or with the Voter at Home Institute online, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, first, I, I am at pretty active on Twitter with regards to elections. So uh, my handle is at Amber McReynolds. Uh, I also respond to LinkedIn. Uh, if I know a lot of people contact me through that platform. Uh, Voteathome.org is our website um, at, the, at the Institute. Uh, our our Email is info at voteathome.org if anyone wants to get more info. We also have an Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter account, so you can follow all of our work on that. Um, and then, you know, we work with a ton of other partners, and we also try to highlight our partners' work in the space. So when you follow us, you're also likely following the work of lots of other organizations that are that are engaged and working on these issues as well. Excellent. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to How to Win Friends and Save the Republic. This podcast is a program of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers. For more information about our organization and details on how you can join, please visit our website at nonpartisanreformers.org.